I am super excited today to be talking to the two of you, Gabby and Ruby, who are the founders of Picnic and Thrift, which is such a well-known and well-respected thrifting brand here in Johannesburg. So can the two of you just tell us a little bit more about how you started? How did the two of you start this Picnic and Thrift concept? Ruby and I have had our own separate brands for quite a while. We've also been friends for about over 10 years now, 11 years now. And then in 2019, we wanted to do something different. Um, she had always had her own yard sales in her garden with her products, her skincare range. And I had always had my own little thrift pop-ups in my garden with my thrift clothes. And okay. we decided, uh, we were literally just talking about it on a whim. Like, what if we got a bunch of our friends together, they came and supported us, they bought our products, and we started something. And then I remember we was like, and we could do a picnic with it, because my garden's nice for picnics. We were like, yeah, we could do a picnic and thrift. So I know, I remember I remember how we started it. I, I need to pitch in here and say this. So, yeah. so we were driving in my car, because back then I was Gabby's driver, and now I'm finally getting revenge and having her drive me around, because she actually drives. But anyway, we, we were discussing, you know, Gubby said to me, you know, I know a few people in the thrifting community, maybe they should come as well and sell their stuff and we can, you know, they can invite their friends. And I was like, yeah, that's such a good idea. We can have like little picnic blankets in the middle. And then all of a sudden we were just like, at the same time, we kind of looked at each other and we were like, picnic, picnic and thrift. And that that's kind of how the name was born. That's so wonderful. And then that's we did amazing. it. <laughs> and then we did it. <laughs> and then you just did it. Yep. Yeah. So you were telling me a very interesting story earlier about your contract that you signed, your very first contract that you signed when you decided to go into business together. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. When two friends start any business together, you've got to know that they're probably not going to take it seriously at the beginning. <laughs> no, 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 and, we really, and we really didn't. We really, really didn't. So the fact that people started showing up and taking us seriously when we were just like clowning around like, and we were sitting outside, I think it was actually outside of Zoo Lake. And we had just like, it was the first time that we had been approached by a venue because we were too big for our gardens and okay. we went in and they said to us we'll give you the venue like we want to have you here we want the foot traffic we want to like do something with you guys and we were so excited about it we got in you know we got into a car we started writing up a little contract and then we signed it in lipstick in lipstick in lipstick <laughs> i think it was like a bright pink lipstick that i had just just lying, lying in your car, car. that we was like dirty and fluffy as you know, well we like didn't have a pen and we were like you know what let's just let's because we had typed it up beforehand we were like let's get it done now like this is okay. the right day for it <laughs> Yeah. So you arrived with the paperwork with no pen to sign. No pen to sign. <laughs> <laughs> and that sounds like two artists yeah. to me. Yeah, we, we did the paperwork. The paperwork, you got you got to know, like this contract was like half a page. And okay. it was also, there was like rubbish in it there as well. There was such rubbish. It was just like, and, and Gubby and Ruby acknowledged that they own each other. Yeah, it was like something like, like, like in relationships at the time. It was like in the event of one of us like dying, the other one gets 50% of the business plus the house. Like there's a shared house. Like, there was like nonsense in there it. There was such so nonsense in it, but, but the long and the short of it was it was an agreement signed, signed both, both of us winningly yeah. in lipstick <laughs> that stipulated we both owned 50% of Picnic and Thrift evenly. <laughs> okay, okay. Have you since then uh, formalized a, a proper contract around that? Yes, but we haven't signed it. <laughs> <laughs> so now we have a contract and it's an actual business contract. Yeah, and it's like, like it's on both of our computers. Yeah, it's like, we've, it's we've done like, legally, it's really yeah, nice. We've got even documents like, you know, all the, all the governmental, all that stuff, documents, you know. CPIC forms, yeah, all that, all the okay. CIPC, all of that. But nothing's been signed nothing's because been signed. we still, to this day, do not have a pen. And, and to, be, to be honest, I don't have lipstick lying around in your car anymore. No, no, you don't. Know, <laughs> I think after four years of running a business, it's been four, yeah, four years of running a business, we'd, we'd, we'd have actually been able to buy ourselves a pen. <laughs> <laughs> so what for you have been the biggest challenges about going to businesses as a pair of friends? Challenges. Oh, as friends, mm -hmm. we're both. We're so both I think we're, we're we're yeah we both have anxiety. So sometimes I'll have to tell her like, my anxiety says that your anxiety <laughs> must, <laughs> must calm <Stop>. down. <laughs> um, no, and, and I think also I think Ruby can vouch this. I'm definitely a control freak, <laughs> and okay. I'm so I'm so pedantic, and like I say this openly and full heartedly. So sometimes I want things done a certain way, and that doesn't mean that that way is right. It yes. just means that I want it in that way. Yes. So sometimes I'll call Ruby like, have you done da, 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 da. And she's like, it's it's eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I will, I will do it. Um, and you need to tell your anxiety to understand that I will do it. Just because it's not done now doesn't mean it's not yes. being done. And then also then like that, because she's my friend, I get that guilt of like, oh God, am I just bossing her around? Am I just bullying her? <laughs> and then every time, like every time she just calms me down, she's like, you are, 
but I love you and it's fine <laughs> and I'm, I'm sorting it out. And, and like at the same time, there's me who's like, shame, I'm a little bit of a, of a lost corp, you know, a bit of a scatterbrain <laughs> at times. Okay. So sometimes I'll like tell her I've done this, this and this and this and this and she'll be like, what do you like, like, do you mean this, this and that? And I'll be like, yes. That means the same thing <laughs> because of her pedanticness. It's like, it has to be done in this way. And I'll be like, but I did it. And she's like, but it wasn't done in this way. And I'll be like, but it's okay. I don't think we've had challenges we, as we, we don't, you know what? We're actually both of us. So the typical it compliments challenge. us. Yeah, we mm. compliment each other. I think because she's like very much, I need to be in control. And I'm very much, I need you to be in control. Okay. It works. Okay. It works. So um, you're clear on your roles. Yeah, we're very clear on our roles. We delegate really nicely to each other. We I'm, need I help, must say, open with it. I must say like something that I've really enjoyed with working with Ruby specifically as a friend is that there's, if I sent her anything, like, can you please do this for whatever reason? There's never, but it's your thing to do. It's always, okay. it's always with like an open heart of this is like, we've spoken about it like quite in depth that like this brand for us is more than just a market or a business. This is our baby. This is our love child. Sometimes you so need to So you're not giving it up in a hurry. We're not giving it up at all. Okay. Um, it's not going to be bought out by some big corporation. <laughs> this is our we, corporation. We, we are the corporation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Become the big business. <laughs> did, did you see that when you first started this no. thing? No, no. We, we were literally like, <laughs> let's make a hundred rand today. Like, on the stall fee, yeah. On the stall okay. fee. Like, no, I, like, let's give some people some popcorn and sell. Like, at the time I had skincare that I was selling now, like, that, like changed over to candles. But like, I was just like, I want some brand exposure. Gubby, Gubby had been I'd running been selling, Crybaby yeah. for, for a few years already. And she was like, I just want to people to come stuff. physically shop. Because yeah. people were only shopping for me online because I didn't have okay. a base. So okay. it worked out really nicely. We didn't see it starting in this way, but now looking back in hindsight, it makes complete sense to me that it's evolved into the way that it is. I think the businesses have very much, I'm like both our independent businesses and Picnic and Thrift, I think it's very much taken on the life from our customer base. And okay. I think our customer base is a direct result of both like the passion that we put into the business, who we as are, well as who I we think. are, but also I think who the businesses are that we've yeah. given the space to. Okay. I think that's the biggest thing, especially because a lot of the businesses that we accept into selling at the markets are student-run businesses. Okay. Um, also, a lot of single mothers. Okay. It's like a big thing that we've noticed. Okay. So, so do students typically find it difficult to find places to trade? I think what's very difficult with many places to set up a stall, firstly, it can be quite pricey. So okay. we've noticed, I mean, you get some places that really do, they charge quite a lot for what yes. they're offering, you know? Yes. So I think that's a challenge for people. I think for students, particularly people who aren't old enough to drive or can't afford a car yet, from getting to place A to place B is something that we've noticed yeah. is a struggle for people. Yes. So we try very hard to, to, that's also a huge reason why we don't necessarily have one venue. We try and pop around so that, different areas. So that you know everybody can get come to at least one like if you can't okay. come to johannesburg because you live in pretoria it's okay because we have a market in hatfield okay. but also i think um, that like at least from my experience of being a student at wits and also being in the position of privilege that i was in as like specifically from the point of view of having run my thrift business for years something i noticed is that firstly the average student doesn't have access to most things that I think most people have, like at least older people, wealthier mm. people, people in positions of power or privilege. I think the access to be able to sell, the access to platforms, the access to internet. Mm. What I've noticed is a lot of students actually start their businesses at varsity, mm. sell on the library lawns, sell in between class. And I think there was a huge space lacking for small business development and entrepreneurship in the South African community, specifically the like from a youth perspective. Okay. Um, and I think that's actually very much maybe not intentionally, but that's very much why we did what we did and why we started it is we wanted a space for our businesses as we youth. Didn't have that space. We didn't have, at the yes. time I was 20, you were 24, 25. At the we time didn't have well, the space to sell yeah. our products. So why didn't you think of using a, something like a Rosebank flea market or something that's existing and already there? I know oh, we did. Okay, you did. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 we did. We went to these markets. Because that's how I did it in the 90s and they worked for me. You know what? Okay, so... There's a difference between Picnic and Thrift and a flea market. I'll yeah. say that. Yeah, Picnic and Thrift is defined as a flea market on Instagram because there's not another word. Okay. <laughs> okay. Like, we're a community. The people that come by very specific things, like, quite often we get applications for people wanting to come sell, like, perfume and dog food and things that you would find at a flea market. But we have to turn them down because, you know, what we've curated is a very specific way of 
buying and purchasing and okay. interacting and trading. And okay. I think I know for both of us, because you know, you did the Melrose market, I did Rosebank, we both did multiple markets to try sell in and tried it out in malls. Yes. There was never a space for our age group to come by. And what we were selling were, you know, we were both selling products essentially for our age group. We were selling things okay. that students could afford and students could buy and students could also resell. Like I sold to a lot of smaller businesses as well, so does Ruby. Those spaces didn't really exist for us in okay. in the markets that are already established. And I think, you know, I mean we were also both selling online on Instagram. So yes. our demographic, our target market was already younger. a younger market. You know, yes. It's usually the people who prefer online shopping as opposed to going into a mall. So even if I went to, let's say, a Melrose Market or whatever it is, you know, I would be there amongst all these sort of adult... People selling confectionery and pestos. You know, and... like things that it's like, my, my brand does not fit here. Yes. The identity was lacking. Yeah, yes. I think I think it. I don't think we did it intentionally. I think it was just an organic yeah. way that it grew into so, a space that allowed us to actually sell our own sell products, our own and, products others, yeah. and help other people sell this too. And it's very much focused on the upcycled, the thrifted stuff, as well as handmade, locally made, ethically sourced things. Yeah. That, Sustainability. Sustainable things. That, I mean, we've got people who paint records. Like they, they turn a record, an old vinyl. Into art. into art. You've got people who have all sorts of funky jewelry, but not the kind of jewelry you'll go and see at like Lovisa, you know, or these it's, big it's brands. very it's very alternative. And our stuff didn't fit markets that weren't alternative. Yeah, and, okay. and I know there are markets called alternative market, this market, that market, but it's still it didn't fit the niche that I think we are as yeah. a as a community. Yes. Not just myself and Gabby, but the people who started attending. Who started attending, you know, and started essentially creating community so with us. I've over the years seeded more than 200 groups on Facebook around various ideas. And um, I've seen that when you create a safe space around an idea and there's a real need for it, the people rush in. So I think the two of you responded to a very, very real need in the market and that is why you've been so successful. And what's interesting to me is that so many corporates spend so much time talking about how do they access these young markets? And it sounds as though they're completely missing the mark because the youth are sitting here in front of me going, we'll do it ourselves. Not going to work for us. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I think big, corpora big corporations often look at, you know, how can we get this group of individuals and monetize them? And I think like I've noticed it with Pride Month as well. With I was just allowed to say something And South African Pride, Pride Month. Month. A lot of companies will be like, well, let's let's monetize and commercialize. Buy all the rainbows. You know? Here's every <laughs> rainbow thing. <laughs> buy it. We'll give like a percentage of it to some charity, but buy the rainbows. So do you feel exploited dangerous. when that happens? I don't, I don't feel exploited. I, I think, don't take it personally. I think I've, there's a I've level of disingenuity, that disingenuous behavior that comes from it. I think it relates back to the previous point about big corporations wanting to like, you know, they've completely missed the mark and they're trying to scout. It's the idea of monetizing communities as opposed to allowing the communities to fund and monetize themselves. Mm. Like we're not here to start small businesses so we can be drained. We're here to start small businesses so they can give back. That to me is the point. It's, it's a very different kind of process. It's a different kind of cycle. It's one yes. that needs to be rooted, in my opinion, in the literal definition of the word sustainability. So for you, what does that definition mean? To me, it's, it's cycles that feed themselves. That's sustainability to me. Okay. That means like, I, I don't want to have my business expire. I don't want to have my processes expire unless they don't serve me anymore and I need to change them. But the bigger brand itself, that needs to be continuous. That needs to feed itself. For example, something that we've like worked really nicely with in terms of the nightlife aspect of our businesses is making sure that, you know, no matter what we do, even for our free events, our artists and our DJs who do the posters and who come and perform, they're always paid. And I think that's a big thing is that once they're paid, they're able to also then continue their process of yes. whatever you know business adventure, whatever life adventure they're funding. Yes. They're continuing their cycle. We're continuing our cycle. It, it feeds itself. We're getting something from them. To me, that's like the real definition of like collab, but it's also paid for because I think that's important. I think paying for people who do work for you is important. Our yes. idea as well isn't to, okay, here's our business model. This is how we get our income, you know, yeah. from let's say making the income from the stores who pay to be there. You know? It's not linear. Like, yes, they pay for that space. Yes, that is how we make our income. However, they they have a space where we help them grow 
in that space. You yes. know, there's been so many times, countless times, where people have come up to myself or to Gabby and, and asked us advice on how they can, how they can actually, you know, is what they're doing right for the market? Is it working? Is it working? And we'll be completely honest with them, and we're not yes. going to say yes, 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 it's working. Give us your money. Yes. yes. We'll say, you know what? This like. There was someone, what did they have? They had roller, like they had skate stuff or something. Anyway, Gabby said, you know what? I don't think this is working for you, but if you do X, Y, and Z, this I will work this for you, you know? We're very much... Um, but our other vendors do it as well. I think yeah. I think that's part Everybody of the idea of sustainability other. is that I'll, I'll, like the entire... So the whole thing about being a community is that there's communal input. Mm. Um, communal input, communal ex, uh, expert. Mm. And I think within the like larger vendors group, people give advice to each other, people make comments to each other. There's this level of, um, I'd say honestly, responsibility and accountability. People at the supply markets. each other with stuff. For you example, know? when people, like we've had incidents where vendors have like, you know, shown up on false pretenses and sold illegal goods. And wow. we've had other vendors actually come to us, you know, and say, listen, this is what's happening. We know that this is a family friendly environment. We know that there are children here. We know there are kids who are under 18. We also know that this is just illegal and it's part of your guidelines is that we don't do, we do not sell illegal goods. Yes. This is who it is. This is what's happening. Okay. You know, and this is not something that I think would happen in a lot of other places. I think there would be also intimidation and fear. This is very much like this is our space. Yes. Our space is safe. Yes. We're telling you this so you can sort it out. Yes. So there's like yes. a dual sense of responsibility and accountability. And to me, that's also sustainable. It comes from customers as well. Like if a customer notices something that shouldn't, you know, something not too kosher happening, um, you know, between a, a stall and a customer or two customers or two stalls, they'll come to us and they'll come to us as the organizers and say, we've sp we've noticed that this is happening. Mm. You know, this person's being intimidated. This person might be being stolen from whatever the case is. Mm. And we actually will go and we'll deal with it yeah. in the way that we need to. And I think it's a, it's a joint community effort. Like everybody takes care of each other. Mm -hmm. If somebody is sick and isn't well and they've, eaten something funny and they're not feeling great like people aren't going to just like leave them lying on the floor or mm. sitting on a couch like not well like people will come up to them and say are you okay gonna bring you some water mm. yeah mm. and i mean as someone who literally has been in high school that doesn't happen <laughs> yeah. you know like you'll be sitting there people will just walk over you like yes. you know yes. it's 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 I don't know, it's, it could also be like South African mentality, we are just nice and we do want to try and help people, but no, specifically... I think it's, I think our event particularly Specifically our space. event, like people yeah. take care of each other and they want everybody to feel safe. So from what I'm hearing you say, it sounds very much like your actual job is very much like my job as a community manager with an online community. Because you are curating your content, you're shaping it, and you are also create, curating behavior within your community. Do either of you view yourselves as community managers? Definitely. Um, not, not, not intentionally, not by trade. Yes. I, like I'd label myself as it, if anything, as an entrepreneur, but I, I'd say, I'd say by default we are. Yes. Do you view yourself in that way? Like, weird. You know what? I didn't <laughs> until you brought it up. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it, never, it never crossed my mind. Okay. I'll be honest. I thought I was the organizers of Picnic and Thrift, but it is a community. So, yeah. they yes. need community organizer, community manager. We, yes. I see myself as a mom. Okay. <laughs> of, of, of Picnic and Thrift. Yeah, we um, often okay. call ourselves like the mommies. Yeah. We're okay. always like, we'll say, hi guys, it's your mommies here. Like, you know, <laughs> it's just it's like, yeah, I see it as a family, more than a community as a, as a family. Like, okay. and families have their ups and downs and families have their, their different people and their quirks and their, yes. you know, yes. but it's a family. I definitely would say that I do see myself as someone who fosters spaces though. Yeah. Um, this is something I've continuously like seen as a trend in my life where okay. I've brought different groups together. Okay. I think okay. I'm the same. I, like, I think you as well. I think this was kind well, of Even in only... school, you were, you know, yeah. I would always befriend the underdogs yeah. and okay. the younger grades. I think, I think this okay. was like the natural path that happened for us as individuals. Yeah. Because okay. like, we were going to this line of work. Yeah. So you really are living your heart wish at this point. Yes. yes. There's a little five-year-old me somewhere who's jumping up and down because she gets to play with clothes all day. <laughs> and there's a really sore 13 and 14-year-old who's so happy that she made space for other kids. Oh, that's so beautiful. Oh, now I wanted to cry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all choked up after that. There was a time in my life where I didn't really feel like I could be my truest self. Okay. And when we started Picnic and Thrift, I finally felt like there was a space that I was safe to be in. Okay. That I had initially created for myself with, with the yeah. help of, of my best friend. And yes. I just think that's so 
that's so special. And uh, yeah, I'm just very, I'm very grateful. Firstly, be able to play with candles. And you get to play with candles all day. It was so cool. Candle making party, like little little five year old me who had like a little candle making party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like lit like, on them. Like the, our our like ideal day, and sometimes we'll do this is like we'll spend a day like I'll go thrifting with Gubby and help like like get a whole bunch of new stock, and Gubby will come to me and we'll like make, make candles. candles. <laughs> and, like, eat toast while we're making our candles. Awesome. You know. No, no, for real. We're living like I'm not even gonna lie. I'm so I'm so grateful and like proud of it. But we're both. I'll speak first because I can. Yeah. Like we're both living our happiest selves in terms of our jobs at very least. And and yeah, you know so what? I, I think one other thing. Like I was listening to the radio this morning about they were talking about like terrible bosses, mm-hmm. and I was just thinking to myself like I'm very bossy. Don't forget. I have such a terrible <laughs> boss. No, I, I'm so grateful that I get to be my own boss. Yes. We get to be each other's boss. Yes, like yes. you know, we we also get not to be each other's boss. I take that back. We get to be each other's. We work Hand, together really well. Accountability partner. Yeah, we get we, to be we each work other's really partner. Well together. You know, like like what I'm so grateful for, and this is you, you mentioned challenges as friends, but to be honest, I see just so many opportunities. I don't okay. see the challenges because I can phone Gabby up the day before an event and be like, I am going through hell right now. Mm. Please take over, and she'll be like, sweet. And I've done okay. the same for her. Yeah. And like okay. we, we have each other's back in that sense. Like okay. we'll never take advantage of that. No. Like I think the friendship has actually, if anything, been very beneficial for our business. But I think the business has brought us closer as friends. Definitely. I really do. Definitely, definitely. Um, I think it's also taught us a lot about how to handle situations. We've had like we've dealt with some very, very little situations. We've dealt some very big situations where people have really tried to take advantage of us. And I know for both of us, I don't think we would have been able to manage those situations and the positions we were in, especially as like young women who I think older businessmen tend to prey on younger business women for their ideas and their- Okay. Their youth. Their youth, yeah. Okay. And their influence. So I think, I don't think we would have been able to deal with those situations alone. So you've encountered that kind of, of behavior? Yeah, unfortunately so. It is a trend. But thankfully it's also made us very aware of who we do collabs with, who we interact with, and we how we, business because business. of our space having such a large following now, yes. that level of, of responsibility of how we use our platform and who we share our platform with, and yes. who we give access to. Because like, for me, the biggest thing that South Africa has is issues of access. Yes. And I think access includes issues of inclusion and it includes issues of promotion. So yes. who you promote is is your responsibility as a business. Mm. Absolutely. To be aware who you with. promote is, is is, is you, you're essentially they're they're part of their brand, brand yes. so yes. we have to be very careful of that we we have to also make sure that nobody's going to try and take advantage of the space for their own and our customers and and our customers yeah. our our beautiful customers and our stores you know so your people. traders and your customers yeah okay and the people who come to visit who come to buy in your market who are they typically our traders are our customers as in our vendors yes yes no 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 so so we call our vendors like just our vendors they're our group of sellers okay they're okay. the people that pay us to come and have a space to sell okay and then we have customers for okay. our market so we, we okay. kind of actually i've never so i guess they're all that. our customers they're all our yes, customers yes, so that's just that. the distinction are, that i was saying because I've, we've never we've always made like in i've just realized in our head we've just like painted ourselves as a market like as two individuals like we're just the actual market <laughs> yeah. we haven't really made that <laughs> distinction for us all. they're all people we need to take care of in any you know they're yeah. all in a way clients i'm loving that because <laughs> because for me i was i was just clarifying who do you view as your customer and it's clear to me that you view both your vendors and the people who visit your market as your customers. And I think that's great because it gives you rigor in your system. You aren't favoring one or the other. I think it's our responsibility as the organizers of, of Picnic and Thrift to make sure that both our stall owners and our customers, Satisfied. who are sometimes both, yeah. you know, quite, quite often are, actually are happy and satisfied and safe and, and having a good living time. their best life too. A good time. You know? We get to live our best life. We want them to live yeah. their best life. Our events just need to be nice. Yeah, they just, just they be, just, they just gotta feel good. Gotta feel happy, nice. and, and it's just a good day. You know. I love it. No wonder, no wonder people keep flocking back. <laughs> they just have a good time in your space. So where do you see picnic and thrift in five years' time? Five years, probably somewhere out of South Africa as well as within South Africa. You're right. within Africa. I don't know. Well, we are we are moving to well, not moving, but we're branching out to Cape Town. Yeah. Mm-hmm. At some point, I'd love to branch out to Durban too. KZN um, as well. I know even, even the, the smaller places. We've had a lot of people even saying to us like, please come to Blum. Yeah, <laughs> you know, please come to like Limpopo and Hart. Yes. I don't know about places. that. Yes. But no, but people have said that to us. No, no I just don't know if we should. No, no. <laughs> so I, I see us. I see us. Yeah, I think we need to, look. 
Picnic and Sons of Roadshow road <laughs> with a documentary team <laughs> recording what's going on and how we're doing small business things. That would be that'd nice. Be fun. That'd, that'd be, be fun. That'd be fun. I would love to do something like a, you know, like a sporadic, like just like a documentary like happening. Yeah. I see, I definitely festivals. see festivals. We've spoken about this for a while. We want to do overnight festivals. It's our festival, like two or three day with live music, like with all our musicians music that we've had festival. since like the beginning of our event company starting. I've had this thought for a while and we've spoken about it, but not in depth because I'm not sure how it would work too nicely and if it would actually take away from the, the niceness of picking a thrift being sporadic and you know, once a month, twice a month, but as opposed to every day. But I've thought about a thrift mall. Yeah, we've thought about it. Like a picking of, and thrift mall. I really okay. want like, like a shopping some, space. Something we spoke about, I just, really want this to happen is like I want us to buy like a plot, a plot of land mm. that's going to be like a coffee shop mm. and it's going to be like a crybaby shop and a love yourself shop and like a little section where all our stalls can come and like have their Sell stuff the on display yeah. you yeah. know yeah. like like have Something like a little like shop like that and like a big garden area for us to host our events like at a picnic and thrift home you know <laughs> like I we, just, we've spoken a bit about it but I mean yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna be very like real and honest about where we're what we're looking at like our whole thing is youth development okay. that's really the direction our business has taken the flow in yes I think the market's gonna get along it already is getting a lot younger I think it's gonna continue to get it but I think we're going to see a new influx of new stalls okay. and possibly a discarding of some of the older stalls. Um, not by us, but just by virtue of what customers want. And, maybe, and maybe I think it's going to get bigger. Discarding, but a, a growing up. A growing up, yeah. So I know when I was at the flea market in the 1990s, we had a bunch of brands. There was Mad Dog Clothing and Out of the Blue Neisner. Those are all big stores And now. Big Blue. Yeah. They were all stores that started in a market environment very similar to the one that you're talking about. So very often traders will grow up out of your space into a retail space and, and that's also very, very beautiful. I've, I've always viewed markets almost as an incubation space. Mm. It's a space where I know it's for people to grow. Mm. We, we've spoken to a lot of our vendors about this and something that we've noticed with at least I'd say maybe 70, 80% of them is that this is a playground for them to test their products. Yes. For them to see what works and what doesn't work, what customers like, what they don't like, and how they can develop. Because yes. I don't think most people come and actually like, you know, this is the be all and end all is yes. the market. I think this is yes. a way for them to fund their other beliefs, loves, passions, to yes. also fund their businesses and to channel it. So if I'm entirely honest, and I think the virtue of you know, we haven't spoken about five years time picnic and thrift. I think that's entirely dependent on where our customer base wants to be. Okay. And I think that's also a result of us fostering the space that's rooted in our customers. To be honest, even I think even a year from now things will be different. Different to how they are now, but in a good way. I, okay. I do I, I see positive growth. I yeah. just don't know which direct there's so many different directions. Mm -hmm. Like we're currently growing our nightlife aspect and our promotion of DJs and artists, which we haven't previously done. It's more just been that the markets, you know, for Halloween, for example, we'd have a Halloween party. Okay. Now we've actually developed a nightlife, you know, Instagram page and company yes. as part as a subsidiary of Picnic and Thrift and it's yes. Picnic and Thrift Nightlife. Yes. And that's exclusively focused on firstly 18 plus, but also safe spaces for queer individuals and queer artists to perform and yes. express themselves and show up without the pressure and the social pressure of drugs or drinking. We've started uh, something called First Thursdays, Thursdays. Okay. and that's to give artists, local artists mm -hmm. and DJs exposure yeah. and a platform, a safe platform to to showcase their talent. Especially because First Thursdays itself, whilst like an absolutely incredible idea, and most of the galleries, at least in Joburg, that do First Thursdays, it's all internationally recognized artists, or it's local South African artists that are bigger. Yes. We want to give the space to people literally making art in their garden. That's beautiful. That that would never have the platform to do it in any other space. So that's, that's, that's <laughs> currently the growth of our that's it's currently the direction of where we're going. We're going a lot into our events. Okay. Yeah. You know, okay. Not That's just the whole, market. So not like, just markets, but having other sorts of events. And we have a whole, whole list of things that will be. It sounds mm, like the two that. of you are uh, growing a very, very interesting event company. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we changed the name from Picnic and Thrift Markets to Picnic and Thrift Markets and Events. <laughs> <laughs> and. What I'm loving is seeing two young entrepreneurs with so much energy who are doing so much for your networks. It reminds me of when I was your age and, and hustling at the Rosebank flea market. Hustle. Um, we hustling. do suffer, suffer from hustle culture, I'm going to be honest about it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> hustle yes. culture is real. Yes. So. And I think that you're doing some amazing things. So thank you for sharing your story with me today. Thank you now, for finding us. Yeah, thank you for reaching out to us and 
One of the things that we, we need to speak about specifically is the textiles that come through your market. Where do they come from? And how are they generating social, environmental and economic impact in the world? So I think for starters, the way we work in general, because of it being a cyclical process and an economically cyclical process, closed, I think it's called a closed end economy. The way that we do things is our vendors are entirely responsible for their stock. We do a proof check beforehand to see who's doing what kind of stock. We make sure that about 70% of our vendors are selling thrift. And we're very specific about what thrift means. That can be any secondhand clothing. It cannot okay. be stuff that was bought new, worn once and then resold, if you get me, like not actually yes. worn. So yes. it's not people buying from, I don't know, outlets End like Shane or yeah, none, none of that. We do have quite a few people who actually buy from box containers and okay. those box containers would otherwise go into landfills. I know for me, like a lot of my custom clothing is stuff that that's essentially what's called like, it's, it's landfill clothing. Yes. And it's discarded H&M jerseys with the yes. labels cut out that yes. I then screen, screen print on. Yes. So a lot of our stock comes from that. A lot of our vendors hand make from recyclables. We have people doing 3D printing as well. I think as a whole, the way that the you know, the way that everything sort of works is a, a big thing is the Janusas in town. People yes. go and thrift from there and then bring yes. them to the markets and that's their brand. They also sell online. A lot of people yes. bring stock to the markets that doesn't sell online and it sells in person. Okay. That's so interesting. So a lot of the thrift stores, so we've been into a bunch of charity shops this week. And what for me is very interesting about the charity shops is their, their kind of A-grade products. Mm. They sell only online and it's the bigger grade products that they'll sell in their stores and, and the lower qualities because they say that they, they're they actually having more success selling online with the upmarket uh, niche products than mm. they do in their brick and mortar stores. I think... Do you have that experience within your space? One thing as well that, that I have noticed is a lot of people will have a persona online where this is the type of product that they it's want curated. to be seen. It's curated for this yes. online audience because that online audience may not be willing to get down and dirty if you yes. want to yeah. go to yes. thrift shops and rummage yes. or something. Like yes. there'll be this beautiful, I don't know, a Didas hoodie in there for 20 Rand, but they're not going to buy it because it was in that tub, yeah. you know, yes. but they'll buy it online because they don't know where it came from. Yes. I, I, think, I think you're echo echoing Melanie's point like really, really nicely. I think it's exactly that. Like the B grade stuff is what mostly sells at our market. We have some stores that do A grade that's like it's, it's curated. We've got a store that does like exclusively basketball hoodies and they actually do vintage. They don't do thrift, they do proper vintage. Yes. But I think yeah. as a whole, we have We've had antiques yeah. people, you know, I, I think, yeah, I think it's really about some people love coming to the market specifically because they like to rummage. Yes. And some people are like, they know what they want. They want to go to that store and get that fancy thing. But they, some people, well, you mentioned the online. I think, I think firstly, of course, COVID impacted the online shopping mm -hmm. yes. thing. Yes. But to be honest, it also, it also, I think it, it, you know, in a, in a roundabout way, it gave us a, a bit more of a springboard because people we enjoy shopping outdoors now not in a mall yes. type of situation yes. so i think online shopping and market type of shopping has actually become more popular yes. than then you're going into a mall to shop yes. and because i think the online things people know okay i want a vintage typewriter i'm going to go to this place online to get it yes. they don't want to have to drive through town and and do all of those things they'd rather pay a bit more yes and support a local business mm -hmm. and get their vintage whatever it is but also not everyone knows um, about thrift shopping in different spaces. Yeah. A lot it's of people, thing. We, we, I think, I think in some way we have, comes from. I think in some way we have like commercialized thrifting, yes. um, which I don't think is actually a bad thing. I think any reason to be sustainable is a good reason. Yeah. Although I've heard some like alternative opinions about how we've made thrifting mainstream because gatekeeping yes. thrifting is apparently a thing. Um, <laughs> Please explain that to, to those like, watching gatekeeping <laughs> thrifting. All right, to all those watching about gatekeeping thrifting, that's really not nice. I'm going to explain now why that's not nice. Thrifting is not owned by you. It's not owned by anyone. Thrifting is literally, it's a, it's a way, it's a, especially I think it's, it is very much rooted in South African history and culture. I think that's an important thing to acknowledge. And I think more so from an environmental, never mind a cultural perspective, from an environmental point of view, thrifting, how could you get, it's like gatekeeping using oat milk. It's like <laughs> gatekeeping, <laughs> gatekeeping music, like a particular artist. Or it's yes. like, I get that you don't look as cool now because you're not the only one doing it, but you're actually helping the environment significantly. Yes. And to me, I don't know, 
do, live your life with intention. Be intentional with what you do and look at how other people are doing things and being intentional and accept that. Personally, I love that thrift has kind of become commercialized. I love that it's become cool and yes. popular yes. To, to thrift now. I love yes. that people are like, oh, you got that from like, insert fast fashion label here. Yes. And, and, and then they're like, oh my God, like, no. Like, I, I love that because it, it actually means like, cool we're actually doing something that's really good for the world you know we're yeah. not just yes we're not just having a successful business and a, and a lot of it is unconscious buying yeah but the fact that a lot of unconscious buying is now thrifted is great yes any any reason to go into supporting the sustainable living lifestyle yes. to me is i think phenomenal yes and i think you've actually touched on a very important part there point there because i think a lot of people get kind of an emotional payback we, we all get some kind of emotional payback when we, when we find something that we like in a store. And I think that asking people to give that up mm. is very difficult. And it's much easier to redirect consumer behavior from new to thrifted yeah. than it is to say to people, stop buying. I think the issue isn't about buying. I think the issue is about manufacturing. Mm. I don't think it's about buying. I think buying is, firstly, there's a reason it works. We've always been traders. What what we're doing now when we say buying is just referring to the new age of trading. We're trading money for goods. We're trading. To ask people to stop trading would be the same as asking people to stop breathing. It would yes. be like it's, it's inherent, money it's inherent to yes. bartering not to exist. We've yes. always bartered. So yes. it, you know, just calling it the economy means nothing. It, it always existed. It always will. And I think it is very much what you're saying about redirecting it into what I would consider perhaps is a bit like Marty superior. I don't like that, but I, I think the right way of fashion, the future of fashion, I think this is the future of fashion. I think this is the future of our planet as well. Secondhand goods for everything, you know, or at least most things. And even the manufacturing process, putting pressure on bigger companies and fast fashion outlets to, because they are going to continue to manufacture, mm. you know, these big corporations are not going to stop. Mm. Thrifting is not, you know, as mainstream as whilst we may mm. see it as mainstream, it's because we're exposed to that culture and environment all the time because we work in it. Mm. There are tons of people who don't thrift who have never heard of thrifting, who probably also still have stigma about and seems to be. Those mainstream stores are still going to producing. It's about putting pressure on them to produce ethically mm. to at least some level. And I think a lot of bigger brands have started seeing this trend of thrifting, noticing a decline in sales. And then, you know, for example, noticing also the social pressure and the, mm. the environmental pressure, mm. mostly the social though, of people saying, I will not buy this if it's not 50% sustainable. They are a lot And what of is sustainability yeah. as well? These companies also now, like there's a lot of pressure for them to define sustainability when they say mm. something is sustainable. They'll mm. put it on their labels even like, the reason it's sustainable is because it was made of recycled goods or because it was made in a factory that supports, you know, whatever this factory supports these workers with, it pays good rate, reasonable wages. I think the pressure has started. Like there are a lot of big, big fashion brands out there who have a whole like recyclable section, mm. you know, recycled section. And it's still manufactured in the same place that the, the other goods are manufactured, but at least it's coming from, you know, there's some level of, or there's some yeah. level of responsibility that they're taking, mm. you know, which I think is very good. Do you feel there's a lot of greenwashing in the industry? Yes. Because I, yes. I tell you why, from time to time, something comes through our group on Facebook and it looks very nice and somebody wants to share something, but it's connected to some corporate activity. Yeah. And then we take it into discussion in our admin team and my admin team shred them. Yeah. Because it's really very often it's greenwashing where they're making a superficial attempt to do something here well, over here, slave labor practices are still underpinning their cheap pricing. Well, they're just putting a band-aid on it so it looks Correct. better. Yeah. I Correct. think it's it's very similar, and I, I know it's a different topic and I don't want to get too much into it, but I just feel that it's very similar to this, is the animal testing industry, right? What they do is you get a big brand, and they ha they're the umbrella company, and then there's all these companies underneath. Subsidiaries. So the big brand doesn't do the testing, the subsidiary does. And it's the they same, with, it's the the, it's, I think it's very much the same with the, with the, with the greenwashing. It's like, you've got this big brand mm. who, who's the umbrella company that no one really knows that actually owns all these other little mm. brands. And it's the little brand that's maybe being bashed or being, you know, mm. not bashed, but like it's doing the wrong thing, but the umbrella company isn't because it's sustainable or whatever mm. it is, because mm. it does this, this, and this, and gives this amount of charity, but they're still benefiting from whatever's being done over here. Yes. Yes. So, I, I think that's a really good point. And to touch on that, I think it also echoes pinkwashing. Mm. You know, something that we have seen a lot of is pinkwashing in terms of brands jumping on the bandwagon of it's Pride Month, let's wake up and support gay people. Yes. And I think 
you know that social pressure so there's no there's no lie the world has become a lot more conscious socially conscious environmentally conscious economically conscious of everything that we're consuming and i think that's because we're in an age of consumerism that we've never seen mm. media is consumption right now we are yes. constantly consuming yes. everything around us thankfully there's been a lot of content put out by a lot of different corporations that will explain you are constantly consuming which means you need to be aware of what you're doing on the flip side of that is you know it's it's kind of like giving ai a prompt of okay make this look less less pushy and consumerist. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like it's a bit Especially, of a, I think exactly. for corporations and it makes sense. It's very, from marketing perspective, it's very reasonable from a like lawful evil perspective. It's very fair. Mm -hmm. They're looking at things of, okay, cool. Consumers are no longer buying. How can we get them to buy? They need to be more into- Consuming, uns, us you know, talking about you consuming. <laughs> yeah, they need to be more into socially conscious brands. Cool, let's donate 40% of our earnings to whatever, this movement. charity is whilst again like you were saying having slave labors i think even the thing of like this is made from you know 50 percent recycled goods and then you find out a lot of the factories that are doing that and there's two south african ones specifically who do that their recycled goods are their factory rejects that is brand new manufactured material that is wow. that is not that is not the recycling rejects. their factory rejects wow. that's not recycling yes. and it's yes. and but from a consumer protection act it is it yes. is considered considered recycling it's because they're using they're using up their waste product it's exactly. very very interesting so then that's why they can a lot of these brands will get away with saying um 70 is recycled when it's it's literally the, they'll purposefully i mean i don't actually i don't know about that but there will be damages on items and they can just throw that into the mix it's disingenuous it's just the intention is not what they're saying it is it's the bottom line and i think if more consumers ask the questions consumers also need to be down. i agree and i think consumers need to be taught that's a big thing i think that genuinely they should teach in school how to purchase you know, we, we don't learn about how to purchase how to consume we really don't we don't learn about the importance these are not critical these are critical thinking skills that we're not taught i love that critical thinking skills we're not taught to, sol to hold ourselves accountable. And often it, throughout history, we've turned a blind eye to the happenings going on mm -hmm. outside our front door because it's more comfortable to do so. I think the first thing people need to do to hold themselves accountable is to let themselves be uncomfortable. And on that note, I think I'm gonna end this <laughs> so that people can think about being uncomfortable a little. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to both of you. That was an amazing, amazing conversation. I appreciate both your time. Thank you for the, that fascinating window into it. Thanks for exploring. Thank you for, for coming. <laughs>